We are so glad that all of you are here and are ready for announcements. Now, camp meeting starts August the 4th. It's on faithfulness, and we have a lot of details about this special month to share with you today. Camp meeting starts this Friday evening. Here's Pastor Miguel to tell us more about it. Julie Andrews famously said, let's start at the beginning, a very good place to start. And for our Friday night series on August 3rd, we are excited to start with a theme called Holy History. As you may know, the book of Romans begins by looking at faithfulness through the scope of Israel's salvation history. So come as we learn what makes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob special. What can make you special? A hint? It is your faith. Come join me Friday night, August 3, 7 p.m., Holy History. Also on Saturday night, Pastor Ralph Watts, who is a member here at this church, will share his incredible testimony and story about the fall of Saigon and how he was instrumental in rescuing and saving lives, getting them out during the Vietnam War. You won't want to miss it. And then August 25th, Veritas is back. This is a ticketed event. Here's Pastor Gilda to tell us more. Back by popular demand, we have Veritas Vocal Group coming to our camp meeting series. We had such a great time with them last year that we invited them to come again this year. And they received such a warm welcome from you that they agreed. If you would like to have an up close and personal encounter, I invite you to go to iTickets and purchase the VIP tickets. At 6 p.m., the doors will open for you and you will be able to participate in a Q&A and have your photo taken with them. I look forward to seeing you there. That's it for announcements. There is more information of things that are happening here at the University Church. Just check out your bulletin, the church app, the website. We would also love to connect with you individually out at the UConnect Center in the foyer. And with that, we wish you all a wonderful Sabbath day.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Ooh, maybe you couldn't hear me. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord today. If you are just glad to be alive, if you're just glad to have blood flowing warmly in your veins, just let me hear you shout amen. amen. Truly, truly, it's good to see each of you, your beautiful faces. We welcome each of you to the Loma Linda University Church for this wonderful, blessed Sabbath service. And we know that God has a special blessing just for you. And I would advise you not to leave until you receive your blessing today. Amen. We hope that during this very warm season that you're finding ways to hydrate yourself and to keep in a cool place so that you can be okay, amen? We want you to reach out to someone near you, behind you, around you. Give them the biggest smile that you can find and let them know that you are happy to see them today. We would also like to extend a very warm welcome to our friends, our family members, those of you who are watching online, wherever you are in the world, we want you to know we welcome you here to worship today. At this time, we have a special presentation brought to us by Brother Aaron Lay, who is our UReach Executive Director. Thank you, Pastor Adrian. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm excited to provide you with some information on how you can become involved in our community. As you can see in your bulletin inserts, UReach has a number of existing ministries with volunteer opportunities, and we've got more coming down the pike to look forward to as well. The Loma Linda University Church is committed to outreach in a very real way, and we appreciate all of your support in that regard. I'd like to take some time just to highlight a few of the ministries that are currently in need of volunteers. One of our longest standing programs is the transit program. This program helps people go from A to B, who otherwise don't have the means or ability to do so themselves. I've, uh, I've had the privilege of driving transit a few times, and I can tell you what a blessing it is. The Loma Linda University Church is all about growing lifelong disciples of Christ, and that starts by developing meaningful relationships, which the transit program facilitates. So if you are wondering how you can get involved in your community, or if you're just wondering what all the hype about the Toyota Prius is, and you want to take one for a spin, I invite you to, to consider joining the transit program and providing a, a true blessing to those in need. One of the other ministries, as you may know, of the Loma Linda University Church is our Relive Thrift Store. Our store manager, Paul, is probably one of the more genuine and mission-driven people that I've come in contact with. And I know he's always looking for willing volunteers and is happy to work right alongside you. In regards to the thrift store, we would ask everyone to do their absolute best to drop off donations during posted store hours. What often happens when you leave a donation unattended overnight or over the weekend is it becomes rummaged through, becomes damaged, and ultimately it becomes unusable. We recognize the challenge that this poses for professionals and students who have a busy schedule and can't get there during the normal day hours, and we're looking at solutions to address this situation, and we'll be coming out with something shortly here with that. Finally, I'd like to turn your attention to one of our newest ministries, which is the UReach Cafe, located in our courtyard just outside of the south side of the sanctuary. It's, um, it's a great place to come and get good food while providing outreach to the community. Our UReach Cafe serves two purposes. I like to call it outreach through inreach. It provides a place for people to gather together, enjoy a meal in a church setting, and all the proceeds go to support our outreach ministries of this church. So in effect, you can enjoy a meal while supporting a meal for someone less fortunate. So if God is working on your heart this morning and you want to volunteer or you just don't know how you may get involved in the church, whether it's outreach, whether it's cameras, I know we need camera operators, whether it's audio, if you want to become involved in the church in a very real way, I encourage you to reach out either to myself, one of the pastoral staff, one of our representatives at the UConnect Center in the foyer, 
Together we can be the positive change in our community as we continue to grow in our walk with Christ. Thank you so much, Aaron. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Welcome to worship. Shall we enter into his presence? Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can come boldly to your throne and praise your name and offer our petitions and offer you sacrifices of our hearts. Dear Lord, we ask that you will help us to be humble, that you will help us to represent you to a lost and broken world. Dear Lord, right now we come together as a community. We ask that you will soften our hearts, that we might be open to one another's trouble, that we might see those who are hurting and those who might be in need. Lord, I ask that you will bless us, that we might have the spirit of Jesus as we interact with one another. Lord, if there is a difference between us, Give us the courage to make it right, to mend our fences, that we might represent you in all of our relationships. Dear Lord, many in our midst are hurting or are suffering from illness or conditions even unknown. Lord, I ask that you'll be near them and may they sense your presence. Send us in some way to tend to them. Be with those of us, Lord, who have sin. We ask that you will forgive us of our sins, some secret, some out loud. Lord, they all make us broken, and we seek your healing hand in our lives. Lord, we lift up especially just now those firefighters who are working so hard to restore our communities, our state, the western side of our country, Lord, to its natural order. Lord, be with the firefighters and all those who are working so hard. Be with those who have suffered great loss. Lord, the victims, we pray you will be near. May we find a way to support and to help and to reach out. Lord, be with our leaders uh, at 
Pine Springs Ranch who once again had to cancel their season. Dear Lord, be with all of our leaders who have had to make such big changes. We ask a special, a special intervention for our camp. Lord, may it not burn once again, we pray. Lord, I ask that you will be with us as we tend to one another. May the children of this church see our example and may want to follow in our footsteps. Lord, we're on a building program that you have blessed. We ask that you will help us in that endeavor. And may all our efforts be humble and only to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. so excited about what's happening to our North Campus. That's where our family's ministry building is. And friends, if you haven't peered in one of those little, those little windows cut in the fence just for us, then you are missing out. They are excavating. They call it over-excavate because they dig deeper and they bring the soil back and they compact it and now it's ready for foundation. They're almost done with the third and last section. So you'll see that we have one, two, and the third section right over here where um, the amphitheater will begin. That is be, uh, being compacted. And soon, I think within about a week and a half, they're actually going to carve out for the foundation. You will then see how big our ministry building will be. Friends, I think you'll be surprised how big this will be. <laughs> It, it's going to dwarf the sanctuary. You'll be standing on the top, uh, the top deck and looking down on the roof of the sanctuary. This will reinvigorate. This will reinvent the ministries of this church. This will draw folks into discipleship. This will provide for our young adult ministry who has no home, who have no home. We're borrowing from the university to uh, have our young adults there. Our world-class media ministry needs a home. Our maintenance needs a home, as well as many, many, many adult ministries. And friends, those of you at home, we call you our, uh, our extended family. They are viewing at home. We want to invite you to be a part of this building program. And that means giving donations as, a, as an invested uh, family member of Loma Linda University Church. We had a really great June for this summer. Summer is typically down, but this June, $106,000 came in to support the building program. Can I get an amen? amen. Friend, this is just amazing and fabulous, and the Lord is blessing through your generosity. Friends, this is not for the faint of heart. This is, this is for those of us who have great courage and want to give sacrificially, not only of our spirit, and utilizing our faith, and let me tell you, it's utilizing every fiber of my faith, and our good offerings. We are going to build this program. Friends, do you realize that about this time next year, in a couple months, we're going to be done? About this time next year, uh, in the first of fall, we're going to be done. And folks who have come to me and said, Pastor Mace, I don't think I'm going to be alive when this thing actually happens. I'm going to say, no, no, hold on one more year. It's going to be done. <laughs> this is very exciting, and I hope that you get excited too. You're on a winning team, and that's God's team. Amen? Something significant happens this week. What is that, Richard? Thank you, Pastor Doug. So, about a month ago, Pastor Doug and I uh, made an announcement that periodically throughout this year, our building. This is a time where we will uh, come together. We want as many of you here as possible to ask questions. It's also a time where we can bring forth new information and new plans that we have because as the building is being built, while everything is planned, there's things that you know, are polished so and so forth. Now, our first information session will be this Wednesday, August 1st at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. It is important that as many of you who can make it be here. This is important. We do not see ourselves as just building a building of ourselves. 
We are see, see ourselves as building a building for this congregation. Amen. We have a few moments uh, on Sabbath for Pastor Doug and I to share with you up here things that are going on. But we often see that as an act of worship, part of the worship service. These information sessions will allow us to further reach out and get on a face-to-face -face basis with you to ask questions that you may have that linger or that come up. So that as we all move forward, as you partner with us, as, as Pastor Doug has said, and as we all get on the same page and move forward to the building of this ministry building for God's work, we all feel good at heart about it. Amen. Won't you say it with us? We, we build, build for, for his, his kingdom. kingdom. Amen. Amen.
Boys and girls, it's time for our children's feature. So come on down, come to the front, join me. Yeah, come on. I'm gonna have a seat right here. Wow, you're very excited, aren't you? So I have a surprise here for you, but we're gonna talk about this in a moment. Today, Pastor Miguel is gonna be talking about the importance of empathy. Do any of you know what that word means, empathy? Can anybody tell me what empathy is? Anybody? Anybody? Empathy? Not no? Me. It's a difficult word, isn't it? Oh, uh, not MVP. Oh. Empathy, yeah. <laughs> not MVP. Uh, empathy. Does anybody know what empathy is? Well, empathy is trying to understand someone else's feelings right, to try to understand how other people are feeling. One way to think about empathy is to walk in someone else's shoes. Now, does that mean that we actually take off their shoes and we walk in them? No, no. But we can use our imagination to think about what it would feel like to actually be in the same situation that they are. So we're going to actually try to practice empathy this morning. So I brought this box with me. Uh, I need a volunteer to help me open the box. Or, Okay, so open it up. Open it up, Sarah, and yeah, pry it open. What's inside? Shoes. Shoes. All right. Can you take them out and show them to everybody so everybody can see? Yeah? Show it to the people on that side and over here. Now, are these shoes like really clean shoes? No, they're not very clean. They're a little bit stuffed up. Well, along with these shoes is a little card on here that tells about the little girl that was wearing these shoes. It says, this girl wore dirty shoes to school. Some of her classmates start making fun of her because her shoes were dirty and scuffed up. Is that nice? No. no. How do you think that made her feel? Sad. Sad? Sad? Embarrassed. Embarrassed? Happy? Yes. A little bit? Lonely? Yeah, lonely. She probably felt lonely and, and felt like nobody was with her, right? So how could we help her to make, to feel better? What things could we do or say to help her feel better? We could be her friend. We could be her friend. Yeah. How could we show her that we're her friend? Show respect. Show respect. That's a good word. To be nice to her. Play with her. Show her kindness. Play with her. Play with her. That's right. Yeah. Different ways to show. Okay. We're going to try another box now. Box. You'd like to open this one? Okay. I'll open it up. Open okay. That. Open it up. Pull out what's inside. What's, what's inside there? Clean shoes. Clean shoes, okay. It's a little dirty ring. All right, have a seat, please. And show, show everybody what, what those shoes look like. Yeah. Now, are these girl shoes or boy shoes? Boy shoes. And are they like church shoes or running around shoes? Church shoes. Church shoes? Actually, they're actually running around shoes, right? Yeah. So here's... Here's what the little boy who was wearing this was experiencing. In gym class, a boy trips on his shoestring because he didn't know they were untied. Have you ever done that before? No. No? no? You always tie your shoelaces, huh? While playing basketball, and he begins to cry, and then everybody looks at him. So what do you think this little boy was feeling? Sad. Sad? Embarrassed? Embarrassed? Anybody Lonely. else? Lonely. Lonely, yeah. Hurt, right? Yeah. So how do you think you could help him feel better? Uh, a band-aid. You could give him a band-aid. That's right. Uh, look, look at me. You could be his friend. You could be his friend. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. oh, to say you're sorry for him. Yeah. Or like help him up. Help him up to go there and help him up. Him See, all of you are very good at showing empathy. <laughs> Thank you so much for practicing empathy with me. But you don't have to stop practicing empathy when you go home. Actually, I want to encourage you to continue to practice empathy by trying to understand how other people feel and then helping them to feel better. Deal? Deal. 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 All right. You can head back to your seats now.
Today's scripture reading is found in Acts 17, verses 15 through 25. I will be reading from today's New International Version. If you wish to follow along in your pew Bible, the pages are 1650 and 1651. Those who escorted Paul out brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found even an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth 
and he does not live in temples built by human hands. He does, is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So amidst the vast landscape and cornucopia that constitutes American literature, there is one novel that is experiencing a sort of a renaissance. Of course, I'm referring to that classical masterpiece written by J.D. Salinger, The Catcher in the Rye. The book has managed to appeal to a whole new generation of readers that have connected with the tale's main motif, namely adolescent angst, which is crystallized in the protagonist, Holden Caulfield. Now, many of you might remember that the book is a story about young Holden's search for meaning, and it serves as a cautionary tale against the dangers of growing up and selling out or giving in to an adult world that seems exceedingly disingenuous. Now, Selinger's brilliance is that he offers a critique not about the biological processes by which we get old, but rather he talks about the systems and structures that we set up, systems that are sadly devoid of the virtue and innocence, the very zest that characterizes youth. Nowhere is this more apparent than in young Caulfield's excursus against religion. He says, I hate preachers. You know, like the ones they had at every school I went to? They all have these Holy Joe voices that they start using when they deliver their sermons. Oh, how I hate that. Why can't they just use their normal voice? They sound so phony when they talk. Now, I need to confess to you that this week, I picked up my copy of The Catcher in the Rye and began to read the book. And that particular paragraph did not afford me the affirmation I needed as I prepared this homily. But you and I need to covenant to something today. And that is that you will call me out during the sermon or any other presentation along with my fellow colleagues on staff if at any point any of us go off and start using Holy Joe voices, even if we don't know what, what that quite means. I want you to hear the words, and then I want you to think if there is a point of contact between that scathing critique written 50 years ago and a more recent excursus, written by that political satirist, late night comedian, and avid and avowed atheist, Bill Maher. Maher writes, I've never met anyone less like Christ than Christians. After all, for most of them, the Bible is simply a software license. I mean, they hardly ever read it. And when they do, they simply scroll down to the bottom and click, I agree. And for decades, scholars in religion, preachers, and people of faith have continued to bemoan the lack of influence that religion has in the marketplace of modern day ideas which has led a lot of us to say that we have a marketing problem, that our issues are with relevance, that our quandaries are centered on worship styles, and heaven forbid, we have issues with music preferences. And as we learned last week, the coup de gras, differences in decor. But if we're honest, if we're mature enough to look at ourselves in the mirror, we will realize 
that what has afflicted the church is the same malady that has been with us from the very beginning. You see, us Christians have a problem of authenticity. Because after all, what people want more than anything else is for us to be real. That old adage coined by Phil Robinson in his magnificent movie, Field of Dreams, sounds every bit as important today as it did all those years ago. If you build it, they will come. People will come. They will come to our church for reasons that they can't even fathom. They will turn into our driveways not knowing why. They will walk up to our doors and knock on them, innocent as children, longing for the past. Oh, yes, friends, people will come. And that is why my colleagues and I have spent the past few months attempting to build a new vision of church, one that goes beyond these walls and these services, one that is broader than the fences of our sanctuary because it dares to encompass the fellowship of the saints. For our construction project, we have chosen to use the book of Acts as a blueprint. And so this morning, one last time, I would invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, and we will be focusing on verses 16 and on. By this time, we are pretty well acquainted with Luke. We have realized that he loves to use these phrases that inject a Camelot-like quality into the life of the community. In Acts chapter 2, he provides us the very first snapshot of the church. He writes, and they were all together under one roof, and Peter stood with the eleven. In chapter 4, the image becomes even sharper as a photograph comes into focus, and Luke writes, the company of the believers was of one mind and one heart. But after chapter 4, something happens in the book. The image becomes once again blurry, and those wonderful lines become less and less frequent until they cease. In the fifth chapter, we learn how the economic unity of the community is shattered when two of its members commit embezzlement, Ananias and Sapphira. Later on, we will learn how those linguistic differences that have been cast aside during Pentecost have now come up again, this time in the form of a complaint due to impropriety in the distribution of goods and services to the Greek brethren and the racial and national barriers that had melted at the feet of the Spirit arise again, divisive and tall as always, as the church ceases to focus on its mission and begins to have conversations of circumcision and dietary praxis. And it is in this malaise that Luke introduces our story, chapter 17. It's almost as if he's trying to remind us that church unity is not a memory in the past that we are called to recover, but rather it's a hope, a goal that we are called to move toward. Today, today's scripture takes us to the very heart of Hellenistic culture. To be sure, the Romans had conquered the world through their military might. But any conversation that had to do with intellectual discussion was framed by the Greeks' understanding of art, biology, history, and philosophy. This is the world that Paul parachutes into. 
Luke begins to develop this image. And what an interesting image it is. When you think about it, it's rather comedic. Here you have Paul, an observant Jew, merging in and out of the traffic in the Athenian Agora, which is just another fancy name for marketplace, surrounded by altars and cacophonic prayers of a people steeped in religious syncretism. If Paul would have been thinking at that moment, we could imagine him saying something like this, well, I, I, I hope the Jerusalem brethren don't see me here. I'm pretty sure if James and Peter know where I am, they would say I'm out of compliance. They might even form a committee to come down here to Athens and make sure that I am acting in accordance with church polity. This is where Luke takes us to the observant Jew who lands in Athens. We learn very quickly in verse 16 that Paul is burdened, his heart heavy, his spirit in uproar due to the idolatry. And so we can almost understand why the very next piece of the text tells us that Paul darts towards the synagogue almost in a beeline. And it makes perfect sense, friends. I mean, after all, if you're going to start a cultural revolution, well, you need to convince the Jews. You need to preach the gospel to them. I can almost picture Paul delivering his homily and coming out, leading a rabble, tent peg in hand, beginning to smash all the idols to smithereens and free Athens from idolatry. Which is why the second half of the 17th verse seems so odd. Because what we see there is that Paul has somehow managed to coalesce his visits to the synagogue with daily appearances in the marketplace. And this is what's so beautiful about the gospel. You see, Acts calls us to live relentlessly and to boldly proclaim. And the reality is that Paul's words, boldly proclaim, can never wither. Let me repeat that. A bold proclamation of the gospel can never wither. Because the words have the power to bind together both the Jewish diaspora and the Gentile marketplace. What a scene that would have been. And we know that it created quite a bit of ruckus. Because verse 18 tells us that Paul is now surrounded by Epicureans and Stoics. So let me offer you a brief explanation of these two particular schools of thought. On the one hand, you had the Epicureans, who believed that the purpose of life was to find happiness through bodily pleasures. The Stoics, on the other hand, believed that living was about asceticism and that happiness could be achieved through the virtues of the soul. The best explanation of the differences between these two thought movements was shared with me by one of my students as I taught an introductory course in philosophy. I asked for my final exam the question, what is matter? And my student cleared his throat, looked at me a little dazed and said, never mind. So as a good professor, I had a follow-up question. And I said, okay, well then, what is mind? No matter. 
I gave him a name. But sadly, the discussion between Paul and the philosophers doesn't have the lightheartedness that my conversation with my student had. And we know this because of the way the philosophers describe Paul in verse 18. He says, they say, come let us see what he is babbling about. The the word in the original language is spermatologos. A literal translation would say, come, let us see what the seed picker is talking about. In context, that word was typically used to refer to a scavenging bird that would pick up scraps of knowledge and then share them without knowledge of proper usage and context. And so you understand that there has been a charge that is levied against Paul. And so Paul must begin by answering the charge even before he presents the gospel. So the conversation moves from the Agora to the Areopagus, a prominent hill on the western side of the Acropolis that was used as a high tribunal where people would come and hear cases in order to have a resolution. As people begin to gather, I'm sure that they come with their preconceptions, ready to dismiss Paul. After all, it's only human, isn't it, to propagate narratives that make sense to us and that we're comfortable with? The scene is pregnant with bias. But just so that you don't think that bias is the sole domain of the pagan Greeks, look at how the King James Version of the Bible translates Acts chapter 17, verse 22. I read from the King James Version. Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye too are superstitious. This is how the King James translators decide to initiate Paul's statement. And it is that particular last word, superstitions, that has a tinge of condemnation attached to it. Now, your TNIVs are much closer to the original translation because what is probably intended is something like this. Ye men of Athens, I know that in all things, you are God-fearers. So do you understand what Paul is trying to do? He's trying to find a point of contact. He's trying to speak their language. He's trying to find a way to link his understanding of the grammar and the gospel of grace with their particular view and cosmology. So what is that worldview? Well, New Testament scholar and professor of Christian origins, Joel Marcus, probably says it best when he describes the situation that is going on in Athens as Paul arrives. He writes, the Greeks and later the Romans, rather than telling the immigrants that they would have to worship the Greek gods exclusively, adopted the practical solution of saying, all right, you continue to worship your gods and goddesses so that nobody, and I do mean nobody, feels left out. We'll worship them too, and you worship ours. And that way nobody's god was slighted and everyone was happy. And so this would have sufficed. Except Paul isn't interested in establishing a mere point of contact. To be sure, he understands that Christ transcends culture. He understands the necessity of being religiously sensitive. But before you throw up your hands and give way to the temptation of saying, oh, Paul has retreated to religious relativism, understand that he doesn't stay there. 
For what follows in the text is a fiery sermon. Now Paul isn't interested in establishing mere points of contact. No, he wants to build a bridge. And he will use a statue, an altar, and a god as the brick and mortar, cement that will glue this bridge together. What then is the purpose of the sermon? Beatrice Roberts puts it best when she writes. What Paul's sermon does, however, is to take the basic presuppositions of Christian teaching and recast them in language available to the audience. In this instance, the gospel is genuinely translated even if some elements never appear. So successfully does the sermon speak in the voice of the philosophers that it makes some readers anxious, concerned that Paul may have been cheated by the exchange rate in the marketplace of Athens. So let me tell you what I find truly extraordinary of the sermon, about the sermon. It's Luke's Paul, not Athens. In the history of interpretation, too many of us have been enamored by the allure of Hellenism. Like people starstruck by a celebrity, we read the text and fixate on the names. Epicureans, Stoics, Athens, Eropagus. And such a reading of the text prevents us from seeing the miracle that Paul is working through his words. Because here he is, an observant Jew embracing the unclean thing. The apostle reaches out into the Gentile world in order to open up a way for them to participate in the world that Christ's death and resurrection has brought forth. To be sure, he still has problems with idolatry, as we said. But Paul does something outrageously marvelous with that angst. He decides to run towards the idolaters, not run away from them. And today, the church is called not to retreat to the security of our cloisters in order to preserve our cultural or covenantal sensibilities, but rather we are called to reach out into the world and touch it to the point of embracing it closely. That is the transformation and the miracle of the gospel. I mean, friends, look at it. Here he is, encircled by altars, the man responsible for orchestrating the stoning of Stephen. And once again, he is surrounded by rocks, rocks that could serve as weapons and would give way to his righteous fury. Only this time, Paul must submit himself to the Spirit. His anger must succumb as God gives him a new word to speak. And what word is that? Oh, it's an outrageously fantastic dream one in which every single person who hears the name of Jesus will accept the gracious invitation and join in communal fellowship. Oh, one in which everyone who hears Jesus lives will adhere themselves and become part of the body of Christ. Now notice that Paul never calls people to condemnation. He always points them to condescension. He understands that the first principle of effective evangelism is recognizing that as human beings, that which we have in common is far greater than anything that would tear us apart. 
He has learned that the root of redemption is the resurrection, not death. And so he will forego any temptation to base his message on fear. Because when we talk about the resurrection, we are not speaking in religious speech. It's a different kind of language, a language that can alter the very fabric of reality as it shifts the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at each other, the way we look at our world. It's a language that demands conversation partners and a response. And there are only two options. You can choose to laugh, as some people did at the Oropagus, or you can elect to believe. You can turn away and run, or you can turn into his body. Because in the end, all that we really have is his body or our stones. So somebody asked me once, well, what is the purpose of church? And to tell you the truth, I was, I was thinking about Paul, his sermon, the Oropagus, our call. I was thinking about Athens and Jerusalem and my mind was jumbled. So I picked up my copy of J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rhine. And I read one of the last scenes, the one in which a desperate Holden Caulfield breaks into his parents' house. He wakes up his sister in the middle of the night and tells her, Phoebe, I'm ready to go home. You see, I'm, I've been expelled from school. I don't know what to do with my life. I think I'm going to end up going west. The 10-year-old girl rubs her eyes, looks at Holden and says, but what do you want to do? Holden pauses for a moment. What do you mean, Phoebe? Well, do you want to be a lawyer? Or maybe a doctor? How about a sailor or a soldier or a tinker or a tailor? How about a merchant or a chief? Nah, I don't want to do any of that. So what do you want to do? It's crazy. It'll never work, Phoebe. Tell me, tell me. Well, I've been having this vision in it, I see thousands of children playing gleefully in the fields of rye. They're so innocent there. And there's no adults save for me. And I sit there, standing at the edge of a precipice, looking at the children, ready to catch them if they get too close and fall over. But that's never going to happen. It's crazy. Church, Salinger had it right. And Holden is not crazy. We are the catchers in the rye. The people of God standing at the very precipice of this world, looking out and seeing how our fellow brethren play around in the fields of rye, and our job is to simply catch them when they fall. If you want to do that, if you want to fulfill your call to being the church, then permit me to invite you to stand with me at the precipice. And if you choose to do that, perhaps it may be a good idea for us to take a break, breathe a bit, reorient our priorities, and come once again to the altar.
where we can meet Jesus. issues. I read once that if you wanted to change something, you needed to love it first. Well, we love this church too much to let it remain being what it is. So permit me to talk to you who have been hurt and now feel hopeless. To you that come Sabbath after Sabbath and are frustrated because this has become a tradition and you have recognized that tradition never leads to transformation. Or you that have been poisoned by church politics. Maybe you that continue to wonder what your role and your place is. If we have hurt you, let me tell you, we are sorry. 
Give God one more chance. If we forgot to visit you when you are at the hospital, we are sorry. Give Jesus one more chance. If we failed to provide the support system that you needed when you were experiencing a family crisis, we are sorry. And if we gave in to the temptation of backstabbing, and talking about each other, oh, we are sorry that we have injured you. But let him restore you. If today you want to say, I want to give God one more chance. If today you want to covenant with me that we love this church so much that we refuse to let it continue being the same, I want you to stand with me. As we sing the last stanza of the song, stand with me and boldly say, we will be what he has called us to be. For we refuse to judge God by the brokenness of his body. Won't you stand with me as we sing? Join us as we sing, thank you, Jesus. This is the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And now, may you go in the peace of knowing that he walks with you, the God who makes all things new.
Hello, good friends. Always glad to be with you. And today I get to greet dear friend Lori Purdy. Hello, Lori. Happy birthday to you, man. Always glad to see you Sabbath by Sabbath here in Loma Linda. Next, Ruth. Ruthie Goodacre, always glad to see you too, dear. And to know it's your birthday is a happy day for all of us, as I say, happy birthday, Ruth. And Florence Miller. Hello, Florence. Wish I had a picture of you. But anyway, I'm here to greet you and say happy birthday, Florence. Hello, Henry Miller, over there in Virginia. Yes, you're a part of us here, and we'd love to have you here on Sabbath by Sabbath basis, but we can't. And so I shout out to you, happy birthday, Henry. And Brian McCorkle. I'm sorry, Brian, I didn't get you a couple of weeks earlier, but hey, you're worth celebrating any day. And so happy birthday, Brian McCorkle, a part of the Loma Linda Church right here. Hello, Cindy Pelton. Always glad to be in touch with you and be reminded of other times and other places. And now to say happy birthday, Cindy. Next on my list is Gloria Jean Redfield. Hello, Gloria. Glad to see you with Jim. And I am here to wish you a very happy birthday, Gloria. And next is Joey O. We are so delighted to have Pastor Joy here on our staff at Loma Linda. I know all of you are too, because he brings a special sparkle, a special professionalism, a special spiritual leadership, and there he is with his wife and girls. Next on my list is Mary Jane Clark. So good to see you recently, Mary Jane, over there in Florida when Betsy and I visited there. And I'm glad to be here today to say happy birthday, Mary Jane, and give a shout out to dear Jack as well. Hello, George and Bonnie Clark up there in Toronto. I wish I had a picture of you folks, but I don't. But I have the opportunity to wish you a very, very happy anniversary. I think it's your 65th. And next is Tom Hibbard. Hello, Tom. Glad to be with you here in Loma Linda Church and to see you there with your June. Happy birthday, Tom. Debbie Christensen up Roseville Way. Always glad to be reminded of you, Debbie, and glad to be in touch with you for your birthday. Happy birthday, Debbie. Angie Lipscomb Armstrong, Keene, Texas. Hello, Angie. There you are with Keith and your children and then with Brenda. I'm so grateful to you, Brenda, for reminding us of Angie's birthday. But listen, 50 years old? Do you know that how old, how old that makes me feel? Because you used to sit on my lap when your mother was a secretary at the Eugene Church. Happy birthday, Angie. Dustin Ajo. Yes, we missed you around here, but you're doing a very important ministry where you are up at Roseville. And I wish you a very happy birthday, Dustin, and to get to see you there with your Lindsay. Hello, Frank and Anita Jacobs, Williamsport, Maryland. And I am so inspired to realize that you folks are involved with mission projects. And I'm here to wish you a very happy 58th anniversary. And happy anniversary go out to Douglas and Jackie Kuhn, also Monticello, Florida. Glad to be in touch with you folks. Wish you the very, very best on your 63rd anniversary. Hello, Lee Ray Nielsen, important part of media right here at University Church. And I'm glad to know it's your birthday, Lee Ray. And I say happy birthday. Glad to see you there with Evelyn. And dear Julia. Hello, Julia. Do you know you're one of my favorite nieces, and I'm glad to be here to wish you happy birthday, and those children are so darling. Happy birthday, Julia Salerno. And Kitty Evans, Keene, Texas, glad to see you there with Chris, and wish you, Kitty, a very happy birthday as well. Hi, Lance Taggart. Boy, I've got a pretty big family extended in a lot of places, and I'm glad to include you in that family, Lance. And now to get to wish you happy birthday there with your Kate. Don Davenport, do we have history? Go back a long time, of course, and I'm glad to say happy birthday, Don, and to see you there with your Carol. Hello, Barbara Baldwin, right here, a part of the Loma Linda University Church, and glad to be in touch with you whenever, and now to say happy birthday. 
and Elaine Townsend. Yes, I know your birthday is coming up with a big celebration soon, and I'm looking forward to being there with you as I now get to say happy birthday, Elaine and Judy Nelson. I know the happiest times of your life are with those wonderful grandchildren, and I'm here to say happy birthday, Judy. And finally, Barbara Orr, always glad to be in touch with you whenever I can, and now to say happy birthday, Barbara, on this very special day in your life. See you next time.